Well, Ventura, welcome to Get Moving TV. Yeah, our show is really, it's about Ventura, it's about the area. As you know, uh, Eddie Taduri with the Rhythmic Arts Project is dear to my heart. Uh, go to fundraisers all the time and uh, uh, there's always some fantastic photographs. I know Eddie is a heck of a photographer. Uh, and so I uh, met this, uh, this man who was taking some, some pretty nice pictures. I think we shook hands once or twice and <laughs> wasn't sure if he knew how to talk because we just <laughs> shook hands. So uh, with me today is David Palmer. Uh, so we won't shake hands today. It's time, time to talk. So uh, how, how did you get to meet Eddie? And then we'll talk about how you came to where you are. Okay, I've known Eddie for five million years and that's give or take a few. Yeah. We, uh, we were in rock and roll bands together back, uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, and um, we were just close and we were tight friends and came up in the LA music scene kind of. We didn't know each other, but we came up in that scene. And um, then I lost track of him. I lost track of him and, uh, and I, I got a call from a friend of mine in Portland, Oregon. And she said, I'm going to send you a newspaper, The Oregonian, and I want you to take a look at this. And I said, great. You know, I took some Somebody had written an article about something. And it's about Eddie and Eddie's involvement with the Rhythmic Arts Project and what he's been doing. And I had lost track for 10 years. So we got back together again and I was astonished. Um, not only in the change uh, uh, in myself, but the extraordinary change in him, you know. Um, musicians are notorious, notoriously self-centered. I mean, we, do, we think about nothing but ourselves. And, uh, and Eddie had changed from this guy who fit that profile to a guy who was loving and caring and um, had this incredible organization called the Rhythm Rhythmic Arts Project. And uh, he was putting on benefits. And I said, boy, I'd love to come up and photograph that stuff because I've changed my, uh, my, uh, my vocation too. I'm now a photographer. He said, let's do it. And, uh, and that's, that's how we reconnected. I think that is, you got Eddie to a T with let's do it because that's, he's, he's really opened uh, uh, everybody's efforts there. Well, uh, <laughs> we were talking earlier about my, uh, my musical career uh, starting just tapping a ruler in the back of a recording session. and A famous recording uh, session. You didn't say that. You have a famous, famous, recording. famous recording session there. <laughs> uh, so w w when did you start? So rock and roll band, so high school, yeah, looking I, for the girls. I, uh, uh, I was, uh, exactly. I was, uh, I was uh, not a great student. I wasn't a great athlete. But when the Beatles and the Stones came over in 60, 65 and 66, I found my calling. Um, and I had a good voice and I was a singer and I became a singer in various local bands and back in, in uh, Wachung, New Jersey and, uh, and I just loved music. I, it became my life. It's all, it became all I was interested. Plus it was a great way to get girls. I mean, let's face it, if you're not a jock and you're not brilliant, being in music is a great thing. Um, and I went to New York when I was about 18. I was in Greenwich Village. and. Um, and it was a great time and a great place, but I could never rake, make it in Boston, in uh, New York, in, in the village, so I started to move around the East Coast a lot with various bands. I went to Philadelphia, I ended up going to college in Boston in a little liberal arts college called Emerson College, which has now taken over the city of Boston, but at the time was just a small college. And around 1972, I got a call from a group that was forming in Los Angeles. And, uh, they had heard my voice, they had heard some records I'd made that had gone nowhere, and they asked me if I'd like to come out and join. And I had no pressing engagements at the time. <laughs> you know, I was just next to destitute. So I got my car and came across country with just, you know, I figured if I didn't fit in with the band, I could get a job doing something, you know, working at uh, whatever was fashionable at the time. So I, I got uh, in that car, came across country, came into LA in 1972 in July, at a recording studio called Village Recorders in Santa Monica, which is still there. And the group that was forming was a group called Steely Dan. And, uh, and I joined the group. I was the first original member of Steely Dan. And we came up with our first record. I sang a song called I'm a Fool to Do Your Dirty Work, which just got picked up for, um, for American Hustle. It was just in the, in the movie. And uh, I sang with the group, and it was uh, you know, a dream come true. It was not a group that toured much. We stayed home a lot at, at that point in time. And I was in about a year and a half, two years, and they decided that they didn't need my help anymore. And, uh, and they asked me to leave the group because Donald Fagan wanted to sing all the vocals, which is what he should have done in the first place. The reason I was hired is because he was petrified to go on stage. 
and I had no problem with that. I loved, you know, again, a musician, self-centered. I loved to be the spotlight. And uh, it's funny though, I got stage fright later on, but that, that's for another story. But I was, I was the front man for a while, and then when, when Donald said, look, enough, I want to sing my own songs, I knew the writing was on the wall. So I left Steely, and uh, left, that's a euphemistic uh, way. I, I was asked to leave. And, um, and I had a friend out in Los Angeles who I hadn't known for years, a woman named Carol King. And Carol found out I was no longer with Steely Dan. She called me, she said, look, I'm doing an album. Would you like to write lyrics? Because she knew I could write a lyric or two. And she called me and we got together. We started to write. And out of that collaboration came a song called Jazz Man, which was very successful in the 70s. And, uh, and in, so my career in the music business continued for another 20, 25 years. Um, very successful and you know, uh, it was very gratifying in a lot of ways. Um, but then I woke up one day and realized I hated the music business. Um, I hated it. And I, was, I had no longer a place in it. I was like 45 years old. And uh, I just, I didn't have any passion for it anymore, and it was out of my life. So I got lucky uh, in terms of the arts, so. Well, I remember uh, talking with Eddie, but uh, maybe it's an apocryphal story since he's in the audience here. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, hearing from the neurosurgeon, oh, you're never gonna play the drums again. And his first thought is, I don't have to hustle for another gig. <laughs> yeah, well, so, that was kind of the way. Yeah. It's a funny, strange yeah. sense of relief that you don't have yeah. to do that anymore. Um, but I, it was partially that, but it was also just, what am I going to do? You know? yeah. And at the age of about 50, I picked up a camera. I thought, wow, I really like this. You know? First of all, I don't have to make a group decision when I take my camera out. <laughs> I don't have to ask four other guys if they think it's OK. You know, I don't have to get a lot of opinions. And, uh, and I like the creative process. And now a lot of people say, well, how is it to shoot film? I will tell you right now, I have never shot film. I was of the digital age. I picked up a digital camera and that was it, and off and running. And, um, and then I started to realize that I just didn't want to be a photographer. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be doing a lot of weddings. You know, first of all, it's real strenuous, and second of all, I, I have an ego myself. I don't need more egos involved. So I, uh, I started just to shoot on my own, and, uh, and I, got, I developed a style. So I, and I'm very happy with what I do now. So when we talk about style, uh, well, you did no formal training, but you developed something that's become the David Palmer style. Is it aperture, lighting? It's, it's basically what I do. Um, there's a, a past master at this stuff, a guy named Joel Grimes who does the kind of photography I, I got interested in. And basically what it is, is compositing. Um, I shoot backgrounds that I love all over the country. And then I shoot people in my studio. Uh, and it's a three light setup. And the reason it's a three light setup is you have a, a, what they call a key light, and then they have two rim lights. And the reason you do that is so that when you composite someone into a scene, you can never tell where the sun's coming from, okay? So it gives you a choice of where you want to emphasize light. And I saw the way he did it, and I loved the way he did it. And, but I wanted to do something more. I wanted to tell stories with this kind of photography. And so I, I tried to figure out how to do that and what I wanted to do. Um, and there are three examples I can give you. Um, back in the late 60s, early 70s, there was a great uh, songwriter singer named Graham Parsons who all, anybody older than 25 is not is going to know who? Anyway, he was a terrific influence on bringing country and rock and roll together. He wrote a song called Grievous Angel, which I love the song. And, uh, and he died in a Joshua Tree. It's a very sketchy story about how he died and what he did, and uh, th that doesn't matter. But what I did was I thought to myself, God, I would love to sort of emulate that in, in, in a photograph. So I went to Joshua Tree and shot all these incredible backgrounds, and then I put an actual woman dressed as an angel into the scene. Now it sounds kind of uh, um, sophomoric in a way, but when I got done, I realized I had something very special with this. So that was one thing I did. Then I'd heard there was a place down in Salton Sea, um, a mountain, a mountain that someone had built down there called Salvation Mountain. I thought to myself, God, I've never heard of this place. I want to go check it out. So I went to Southern California, Salton Sea, and, uh, and I saw this incredible 
structure. It's folk art is what it is. This guy, it's as it's iconic as the Watchtower, as far as I'm concerned. And what this guy had done is he built all this stuff with concrete and put all these religious symbols and God loves you and incredible biblical sayings all over this mountain. I thought, that's great. And, but what had happened to it, he, the concrete had broken in the heat and the, whatever had gone on. So he had to redo the whole thing. We're talking about an incredible mountain. So he finished it up and uh, it's still there. And I, so I shot this and I thought to myself, God, I gotta put somebody into this. I'm not try, quite sure who. I have a friend, this is by the way, one of the, one of the pictures of, the, of, of this series. I have a friend named Jeff Kober. Um, for all you Walking Dead fans, Jeff was on the last year of Walking Dead. Um, he always plays maniacs. He's always <laughs> playing guys who are one, short, one card short of a full deck. And that's who he plays on television. He's, he was also in China Beach. He did a lot of great stuff. And I said, Jeff, I need a maniac for my, my shot. I want, but I want an ambivalent maniac. I don't want somebody who's tearing up the scenery, but I want someone who, and he has that look. So I said, he's all, it, the funny thing about Jeff, he's, all, he's also my meditation teacher. He's one of the most peaceful guys <laughs> I've ever met. He's very, very, very spiritual and very, very sweet, but he always plays these characters on shows. So I got Jeff to pose. This is Jeff. Uh, playing a night, sort, sort of a loose cannon pastor kind of guy. And if you look in his eyes, you don't know if he's totally insane or totally spiritual or where he's going with his, with his look. So that's one of the stories I told. Is there's a six uh, cell series in this thing. And I've also shot New York. I've done a, recently did a New York stories and it's the same thing. I'm interested in stories. I'm interested in seeing how people are looking. Not so much, um, it doesn't have to be the same model. It doesn't have to be, it just has to be something a little off. And, and I managed to do that with most of my, my, uh, my pictures. So anyway, that's my art now. I'm basically compositing, but I call it, I call the series Romantic Realism. And uh, my, my, my website is davidpalmerimages.com. There's a plug, davidpalmerimages.com. And it has my, not only my uh, composites, but also my portraiture on it and landscape. So if I, if I go to that website, can I, do I get prints? I get buttons, hats, you frisbees? Can, uh, <laughs> if you get a hat, please call me and tell me how you did that. Uh, actually, you, can, you go out to uh, another website. It's, if you want to buy, it says right there. Um, you go to another website, and those, they're <coughs> available different sizes, different prices. You know, I, don't, I really didn't want to get into the merchandising part of that. And, and, but there's a site that will do that for you. Plus, I have a manager now who's more than willing to. Um, sell my services to the highest bidder. Thank you, God. You know, I've got somebody. And uh, also, my music's on there. I've have um, some of my old, some of the stuff's never been re released is on that website. If you're interested in listening to what it was like back in the day, you know. So that's my music scene. Yeah. But uh, well, I'm always fascinated by names in the '60s and '70s. So, what, what were the names of some of your first groups? And we'll, we'll okay we'll circle around on well, digital rights. Well, I had a group called the King Bees. That was my first group, because it was based on an old Elmore James song called I'm a King Bee. A King Bee. And uh, we were going to go with that name. And then there was a group in New York who had already copyrighted the name. And that group, oddly enough, is a group that I, it's a long story, but I ended up playing with that group in, in Greenwich Village in a place called the Night Owl Cafe. And it was run by a guy named Danny Cooch, Danny, Danny Kochmeyer. Yeah. Danny Cooch, who later on became a guitar player with various groups, including with Carol and several others. But the singer in that group that we were opening for was a guy named James Taylor. And the group was called The Flying Machine. And James later alluded to that in a lyric about sweet dreams and flying machines and pieces on the ground. And that's what he was talking about. But we had a group called The King Bees, and they had copyrighted the name so we couldn't use it. Then we became the middle class with a Y, because we were all middle class kids. And that was um, managed by a guy named Al Aronowitz, who was a great uh, reporter, rock and roll reporter, and a great rock critic for the New York Post for years, um, and very involved with Dylan and the Beatles and all, all that scene. So he was our manager. But that was the middle class. That's, we stuck with that for a while, I don't know. And that seemed to work. Well, just getting back to your, the, the music and the like, uh, we're in a new era. I mean, it's all <laughs> Spotify, Pandora, yes. Apple, whatever. Yeah. So uh, did you have the foresight to try and protect yourself way back when? I was lucky enough. Um, that became, digital uh, royalties became doable after, for groups that occurred after 1972. 
and I was in 1972, the class of 72. The first was Steely Dan record. But the problem with all that is, is that I had, my royalties were good, still are, with both Carol and Steely. I don't know who buys those records, but whoever you are, thank you very much. It's not records anymore, it's CDs. But uh, somebody keeps buying that stuff, and it keeps selling, and it's great, and I, you know, uh, which is terrific. However, I was about, about five, six years ago, I was called by someone. They said, you know, are you getting paid on digital royalties? Back in the day, you got paid, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to bore anybody with this, but no. you got paid with, your royalties came from writing, so you got your writing and, share, and publishing, or from record sales, and that was it. That was your royalty stream. But since Spotify, Cirrus, all these new royal, all these new things came into being, you also get now paid on digital performances. So every time there's a record, Steely Dan, Reeling in the Years, gets played yes. on the radio, I get a billionth of a cent. You know? <laughs> and if you multiply that by Spotify and everything, it adds up. But I was not aware of that digital royalty stream until someone caught me and said, are you aware of this? And I said, no. I said, well, what do I do? And he said, well, if I were you, I'd go and ask their accountants. So make a long story even longer, I did ask. And they said, well, I'm, we're sorry you didn't say anything a few years ago, so you know, you're out of luck. I said, I don't think I am. And I went back, and a lawsuit uh, occurred. Mm -hmm. Very, I mean, I didn't want to be, it's very funny. The lawyer that I hired said, look, a very prestigious firm in Los Angeles, he said, I'm going to tell you right now, this, it's, this is going to hit TMZ. It's going to hit all the papers. And I said, Are you, who, gives, who cares about a rock and roll group in the 70s being sued? You know? He said, you're going to be shocked. And he was absolutely right. It hit the papers. And it was like, this guy's suing steel. You know, he's been steel-eyed or something. I don't know what the, you know, some terrible TMZ comment. <laughs> and it hit the papers. And uh, they were not happy. And I was not happy. I didn't want publicity. I just wanted, I, as I told somebody, I said, I don't want their money. I want my money. So what happened was, eventually things got settled, and, and there's a whole no royalty stream now for which I am very grateful. But you're right, the digital performances opened everything up. You know? well, and it, I think it kept that song for, the, for in, uh, American Hustle out as a CD. Yes, it did. Well, well they, right they, it, that's a whole backstory that I really don't want to get into, but they, <laughs> they, they managed to really screw it up. And I said, yeah. oh, well, you know, I was just grateful that you know, people went to the theater and called me and said, hey, you'll never guess. And they put in that, they, and they couldn't have picked a better place to put that song. It's in the title of the movie. I was like, "Whoa, okay." So you know, I'm very grateful. I've had a great life. I've had a great career in music. I I, I love my photography. You know, I'm 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 very fortunate that I've been able to work as an artist all these years in some way, shape, or form. You know, because a lot of guys haven't. You know, and it keeps me um, centered in a way that um, that other things may not. It, ma it, it makes me available to people like Eddie for what he's doing and his great work. And uh, I, I'm involved with another project, another charity in Los Angeles called We Spark, which is a, a cancer uh, deal. And, and I shoot there. I mean, I try to give back the way I can give back, sometimes through money and sometimes just contributing my services. I mean, much like you would do, you know, in, in, in what you do, so. Well, David, thanks so much for joining us. The whole fame thing, uh, how, how have you dealt with that? Just to kind of. Well, first of all, I'm not that famous, <laughs> which is really a good thing. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've had I, I, musicians know who I am, and the guys who uh, you know. But it, it, it's been I've been very lucky in a sense. Um, you know, I'm I'm still close to Carol, and we're, we're not, we don't talk a whole lot. But you know, the fame that she had was so overwhelming after Tapestry. I can't imagine being uh, uh, um, having that inflicted on you because it, it, he had no life. It was. It, you know, and since since in the past few years she's become kind of not a recluse, but she's certainly sticking to herself, you know, in private. And uh, and I admire her for that. And I, I anyway. So uh, I, I didn't have that kind of fame, so I'm okay. All right. Well, David, thank you so much for joining us. I have a young man who wants to be famous, and it's got to be something more than just being Paris Hilton. So, <laughs> please, uh, Ventura, <laughs> we're going to be right back. Ventura, welcome back. I'm here with Jaden, otherwise known as King Shorty. Jaden, uh, welcome to Get Moving TV. Good to be here. Well, I've known you for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, we, I think you started, you were around six weeks old or so. You were in my arms and uh, while we were 
doing an echocardiogram of your heart for some doctors in Toronto. Uh, so you've lived quite a life here over the last 15 years or so with some pretty, pretty big events yeah. uh, going on. So uh, t t tell me a little bit about you know growing up because your heart has always been really have the you had the the heart of a frog basically just three yeah. chambers and uh, how, what was it like growing up? Well, growing up it was easy, easy at first, but then it kept um, as I grew up my heart getting my heart was getting kind of weaker, mm -hmm. and I couldn't do as much. I couldn't go out with my friends and play. Um, it was it was sad. I, I was sad. Yeah. That I couldn't go out. So um, I started like staying inside, playing video games with my friends, because that's pretty much all I could ever do. Until I got a heart transplant, which um, changed my life pretty much. Yeah. So, yeah. so I just you know through your through your mom, who mm -hmm. I, I know through through my office there. Uh, uh, you know, we, at one point things weren't going well, and yeah. so I said, "Okay, no more PE, no mm. more PE. We really want you uh, in study hall." And there you were sneaking out and running around the track with the other kids as best you could. So, yeah. so how, how do you, how have your friends done with this? I mean, that's kind of a big separation for you. Yeah, my friends were um, they they were kind of like jealous of me because I wasn't doing PE and they had to. So they um, they would say like yeah you're like um, you're scared to do PE or something like that and um, I was just like I I can't do it right now but I will and but now I am doing PE and it's been going good I can run do, so do stuff. They were jealous of you and you were jealous enough to take this yeah well frog hard and try and run around the track yeah, anyway. Yeah, but I couldn't that like every time I ran it got weaker. So what what do you remember? Kind of going up to the transplant. I, I remember um, one morning we uh, got up and my my dad went to my grandma's house to pick up something. My mom went to work, and um, when my dad was at my grandma's house, he got a call from UCLA saying that uh, they had my heart. And my dad didn't believe it, so he asked them again, "What did you say?" And he said, "We have your son's heart." So luckily he was at my grandma's house so they could calm him down and get everything straightened out and stuff. So uh, he called my mom and they went back to the house together. My grandma came like 10 minutes later and um, saying that we, the UCLA got, got my heart. So we packed everything up. We weren't ready for it at all because we didn't know it was coming this early. So we pretty much just packed whatever, what, whatever was necessary like water, food, stuff like that, so um, we just got in the car and went. So kind of leading up to it though, yeah. you've been getting infusions. Uh, yeah, two uh, years of infusions. Just to, to really try and keep the protein mm -hmm. in your body, and so you're really kind of kind of right there. Uh, how, how many days from when they put you on the list until you got a heart? I'd say about, I don't know, like a couple months. Mm -hmm. And then I got the heart, but um, I've pretty much been waiting like a long time, like since like I was born to get the heart transplant. You know. Oh. Yeah, we want to get you big enough. Yeah. Even if you're a king shorty, we need to get you big enough yeah. to to get through this. Yeah. So now, do you think people should write a donor on their uh, driver's licenses? I don't know. I like. I, I think they should because it helps. It helps with uh, well, we medical. We don't have enough yeah. organs, really. Mm -hmm. we, uh, I was back at the Mayo Clinic, and uh, I, I was introduced to someone who should become my favorite pig, and <laughs> they had my DNA, and they'd raised mm -hmm. him from a little pig, and if I ever need a new heart or liver, there's there's my pig. Uh, but as it turns out, that doesn't work very well. They have different viruses, yeah. so we're really kind of stuck. We don't have a 3D printer that works quite yet, so we do depend on the generosity of, mm -hmm. of the people around us. So the community is going to is drawing around you. We're going to get your your grades up. We're yeah. so proud of everything you've been through and the bravery you. of yourself and your brother and your yeah. family. And, and I'm glad you didn't get in a car accident driving yeah. uh, driving down to UCLA. So so Ventura, uh, have a heart. We really we need you to uh, support uh, transplantation, uh, but also fame. I mean, what's what's that all about? 
uh, that arc, that giant arc of our career. We're seeing Jaden right at the beginning of his fame as King Shorty with more to follow. So Ventura, it's time for you to take David Palmer, take Jaden, take him into your heart.